Caitlin Alvarez and I'm Heather Sariski and we're the directors of One in Five, a devised piece that explores sexual assault and women's reproductive rights. We created this piece to bring awareness to how common sexual assault is among women and it doesn't just include rape, it includes a wide variety of non-consensual human acts. We wanted to bring together a community of women to empower each other to speak out about their experiences with sexual assault and how it's changed them. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and we hope you enjoy one in five. The, the first question is, what is consent? C consent is communication um, in so many ways, whether you meet it in this broad sense or you meet it in relation to, to sex and sexual activity. Um, consent is fluid in some ways, it can change. You are allowed to withdraw consent. You are allowed to um, negotiate your consent in many ways. Consent is living and breathing practice, right? It's, it's not something that like, oh, you got consent once and then like six months later, that behavior is fine. So it's a living and breathing practice that establishes boundaries and behaviors that are acceptable or not acceptable between various human beings. It involves like a check-in too, right? Like it's, again, making sure that we're all comfortable and, and trying to honor what another person's boundaries are. Right, it's voluntary. Consent is voluntary. I would add that it's all too often ignored, assumed, unacknowledged, trampled on, um, just totally taken for granted. Um, I know, as we all sit in this space around women's reproductive rights, and I'm an advocate as we all are in this space, my body is not a bargaining chip, nor is my mind or my spirit. So um, who's determining the rules of the game, right? Because I don't see my voice being amplified in a lot of these spaces, especially as an Afro-Latina. That, that voice is oftentimes dismissed or silenced, all right? Who's unshackling that voice and respecting that? A return to the wild. One, people ask, what happened? She explains, I tore my Achilles tendon. How did you do that? She sighs. It feels silly to explain. I just worked. I just kept working. I just kept walking. I just kept going. She thought, didn't people realize it is impossible to stop on your journey through the woods? People ask, did you hear a pop? She always thinks about this one as if maybe she'll be able to locate the precise moment her body split open, but her answer is always the same. No. If she was honest, she'd say her ankle had been hurting for months. If she was honest, she'd say she thought she was making it up without ever questioning why. Why would I be making it up? People say, that's a hero's wound. Everyone always says that. She explains, it's more like a low budget, poorly written Joseph Campbell story more like a stop sign from the gods. She moves along. Her hand aches against the cane. She's not used to walking in the rhythm of three legs, but she doesn't let it slow her down. She knows it's dangerous for young women to show weakness. As she walks along the path, solitude enfolds her in warm darkness. Her body rattles in pain and whispers questions into the night. Why would I make this up? How didn't I feel my body breaking? When did you learn to stop believing your own truth? 
Suddenly she steps out of the forest and into memory too. I was 14 years old. He was my first boyfriend. I didn't even like him that much. She remembers their first kiss was on a pizza date. The greasy smell still momentarily colors the world of him. It was exciting. To be wanted, isn't that what young girls want? No one taught her what to do when too much became too soon. No one explained that hands and mouths can speak different languages. No one explained how the word no was intended to be a full stop, period. She asked to go slow, kept asking to go slow. Little girls aren't taught the language of demands for fear of being bossy. No one told her, and isn't that what young girls want? Darkness and the soft forgiveness of the carpet, confusion caught in the fibers, begs for a different story because girls who lose their virginity are supposed to be happy, aren't they? Clarity as a child is found in the refuge of friends. So there they sat, two girls with the same name, two girls who grew up on the same street, Two girls can surely construct one whole truth. What happened? She tries to explain. The word rape snakes delicately around the corners of her mouth, but he's your boyfriend. She agrees. It doesn't make sense. Did you feel a pop? She tries to remember. She thinks I, I just kept going. Maybe you're being a little dramatic. The snake goes to attack and disappears all at the same time. You must be making it up. The truth deflates, folds itself up, waits to be picked up again. Three. She steps out of the forest and into a clearing. In the calm between the trees, she whispers to the sky. It's easy for little girls to grow into women who don't believe their own truth. The tear in her ankle leaves a trail of stories, each relocating a precise moment when her body broke. All her life, she had been taught to fear the forest rather than the beasts that roam it. But now she understands, what if the forest isn't my enemy? What if the forest is inviting me back, returning me to something greater than myself? So now she wanders the woods, scattering stories like fertilizer and allows the trees to teach her how to survive when the flood fire and predators come to her door. On my 17th birthday, my best friend gave me a pocket knife. It was matte black, it had a window break, a seat belt cutter on it, I kept it in my car. I carry it to this day. That night as we were leaving Quick Check at 10.30, he checked around my car, looked inside my car, and told me to text him when I got home so he knew I was safe. I was so naive until that point, I didn't realize that driving out on my own put me in so much danger as a woman, especially as a young woman. That whole summer, I didn't put those little red stickers on my car because it would make me a target. My sister also shared the car and she was older and didn't need them. The only reason I ever put them on was because my school required us to have them if we parked on the campus. My senior year, my forensics teacher told me and the rest of the girls in my class that we should take different ways home. It was so that if we were getting stalked or followed that they would get confused because they would never know which way we were going. They would always get them guessing. So I do this even today. I live on campus and I walk different ways to go back to my dorm room. I walk different ways to go to classes. I'm not friends with the same friends and I still go different ways to any of my friends' houses. Even if I don't know where I'm going, I'll use a GPS. My freshman year, my first semester, 
My roommate gave me a thing of pepper spray as a welcome to college. One in five women get sexually assaulted in college. The six to eight weeks in the beginning of every fall semester are called the red zone. So why am I scared to leave my dorm room, to potentially get drugged or raped or kidnapped or all three? To be left on the side of the road, injured or abandoned, and not have any way of getting home or knowing where I am if I'm drugged or drunk. So I don't go out. I don't leave. I don't do anything. I get food. Why do I go to the bathroom with a buddy when I'm in a public setting? Why do all girls do it? Why do I habitually check underneath my car to make sure no one is there to rip my Achilles open and so that I know I can get into my car safe I don't park near any big trucks or any big vans and I park in the middle of nowhere even though I'm disabled and shouldn't walk far but I don't want to park near anybody so I don't why do I get in my passenger seat and climb over my center console to get into my driver's seat if there's a van or a truck parked next to me or I climb through the back door why is it my responsibility when the men take the action, or whoever takes the action? Why isn't it their fault? Why is it my fault? I didn't ask for it. I didn't want this to happen. So I don't take the necklace off my side mirror. I don't undo the wire on my door handle. If I see anything sketchy, I don't go near my car. I go back into where I was, even if I shouldn't. Society tells me that I ask for. Yet the same society tells me to speak out if anything ever happens to me. When when they do, they shame me and they call me a slut. So why do I say I'm lucky? That even though I've been sexually harassed because I get my ass groped occasionally, why do I say I'm lucky? Even though I'm standing there with anyone else who ever experiences that. Well, because I haven't been raped. I haven't gone through a childhood of traumatic issues or year after year with an abusive relationship partner. I haven't gone through a terrible experience at some random house in the middle of the night drunk off my ass because I don't drink, because I don't go out, because I don't do anything. So I say I'm lucky, even though I have had people touch me when I didn't want them to. I say I'm lucky, and we are a generation run by trauma. Trauma we work tirelessly to bring to light so that the future generations don't see everything as darkness, so they don't have to deal with the same thing, so people can be raised better to understand the fact that not all of this is normal. None of this should be normal, even though our society makes it so. Women worry about bringing future children into this world because they're scared of who they'll become or who they will encounter or what experience they will have. We tell our stories to light the darkness so that one day it won't be that dark. I wanted to say I think it's interesting um, whose point of view we're like talking about things from because what do you think about when we say the gray zone, who is it really gray for? Like, is it gray for the person that's being coerced or forced to do something? I feel like if you have to be like, mm, I don't really want to, then that's a no for you. So we're like talking about it from the perspective of the person that's trying to force themselves on somebody else or convince somebody to do something they don't want to do. And I feel like that's another um, form of like disempowerment. There's also the moment of the person in power who, um, who walks over that line and knows it too right? That's a gray zone as well. You know, you know, you're doing something that's, you know, you're asking for something um, that you know is sort of wrong, but you can justify it too. So I'm, the gray zone comes with a lot of justification, self-justification, self-denial, self-deceit, and you don't know sometimes when you're getting in there. I mean, or you, that first step, and once you're in it, nothing can change. So I think it happens for the person that's making taking it, taking the consent too, because they believe they probably have convinced themselves somehow with some kind of justification that they're of right, that, 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 that everything's fine, right? It's a self-delusion. I also feel like the gray zone for these types of situations is often invoked after the fact, right? After there has been 
um, a violation or an empower, a power imbalance, that type of thing, that the gray zone is used to kind of, after the fact, explain away what happened in some ways. The gray area is kind of what upholds um, rape culture. It's one of those things where it's just like, people who like to justify that gray area and trying to make it seem like everything was okay is because most of the time they already know what's wrong but um because they want what they want they're going to do what they want to do it doesn't matter what the, it, it costs to the other person so with that being said with the gray area they try to justify it because they rape culture is so ingrained in our society People have a hard time looking at themselves because now they realize that they violated somebody's consent. And people are mentally going to snap like, no, 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 that couldn't be me. I would never, I would never, I would never, I would never. But yet, then their friends come to their like defense and they're like, oh, well, no, because me and my bros do that all the time. Okay, and now you're a rapist too. You do realize that, right? <laughs> they're like, no, no, no. It's just like, okay, so now we're looking at uh, I hate to even go there, but I, I we're looking at patriarchy now. We're looking at we're looking at misogyny now. We're looking at these different things that you have uh, internalized, and now it's made up your identity. And now you're out here hurting people <laughs> because you refuse to acknowledge the fact the fact that you've internalized so many um, harmful things, and that you were capable of performing those harmful acts on another person, specifically femme presenting people, because unfortunately, we are the ones that, uh, statistically actually go through it more, um, as well as children, and we have to go there specifically, like, cishet men, they don't like to look at themselves, in the mirror and see that I'm sorry, I'm sorry to Chris, but that the shit stinks. So they just sit there and they're like having a whole meltdown. So that's why they create that gray shield to protect that gray zone to protect them because that's their shield. And they will try to convince us that they were right all the time when we knew from the get go that they were not. And the more that we try to, I guess, call them out, I guess the more the gray zone will actually not be all of those 50 shades and rather it just be like okay it's it's here or it's here it's not like this you're somewhere in the middle there is no middle when it comes to consent get there and i'm calling and i'm calling and i'm calling it and i'm like what the fuck and finally he comes down to let me in and he's drunk and i'm like do not touch me like, I am only inside because I'm now not walking all the way across campus again by myself in the middle of the night. And so I go upstairs with him and his one roommate was home. And to this day, I still play in my mind me, like, going into his roommate's room and, like, telling him what was happening and sleeping on the floor and trying to get away because... He was so drunk and he's trying to kiss me and I'm like stop stop like like pushing him away from me and it's like all this like tension you know how like if you're doing tug of war and somebody lets go and you go flying it was like that until he threw me across the room and I was like that's it like and I go to grab my stuff and he's pulling me and everything and i I walk out of his room and I'm crying and his roommate looks at me. And he's like, what's wrong? And I was like, he's crazy. That's all I said. And to this day, I'm like, God, like I should have, I should have said something. Like I should have been like, he just threw me across the room and he's hurting me horribly. But I go into the bathroom and I sit on the toilet and I'm just crying. Like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And then he comes in and I'm like, get out. And like, he's sleepwalking almost. He's so like belligerent. And he walks over to the toilet, pulls down his pants and starts to pee while I'm sitting on the toilet. And I was like, what the fuck? And so I like push him off. And then he's trying to make out with me. He pushes me up onto the sink, like up against the mirror. And is like taking off my clothes. And I'm just sitting there 
crying and crying and crying, begging him to stop. And then I don't even remember how it stopped. I ended up sleeping on the floor that night because I was stuck there. And I didn't want him to choke on his throw up and die. Like, that's how drunk he was. And this is also not that sadly. In my late 20s, I was sexually harassed by a judge, and that's a crazy story. Unfortunately, I have lots to pick from. <laughs> um, I'm in my 50s now. I'm a professor at Rowan. My name is Sandra Joy. I teach in the sociology department, and I worked with ex-offenders on South Street. I loved my job. And so I was going to grad school, studying for my PhD, and one of my clients had violated his probation. I'm going to go to the judge and advocate for you. I scheduled an appointment to go see the judge. And um, so when I went to go talk to him, and by this point, I'm like in my late 20s, like maybe 29 or so, um, I was engaged to be married, and I had a, and I had a engagement ring on. And he was probably in his early, late 50s, early 60s. And I said, I'm a graduate student at, at Temple and I um, am here to, so when I introduced myself to the judge, I told him, look, I'm a, I'm a drug and alcohol counselor. I'm here to talk to you about one of my clients as well. He, it's like he wasn't listening to me, he just was smiling. The first thing out of his mouth after I shared this introduction was, um, an engagement ring I see on your hand? That's one lucky man. And I'm like, uh, yeah. He's like, when are you getting married? And he was just smiling, looking at me in a kind of a condescending manner. He said, why don't you do your dissertation on um, the jurors of death penalty cases? And I can help you come to my office, back here in my chambers. We can go through the uh, files together and I'll help you. He said, come on back and took me back to his chambers. And I sit down and he sits down right next to me. Um, made me very uncomfortable because he was like so so close, he was almost touching me. And he's appealing to me why I should come back and work on the death penalty case. He goes, and when you come back, wear jeans next time and I'll take you out on a ride on my motorcycle. And I was like, what? I'm just thinking to myself, oh, really? Just call me anytime you want to come. I'll just I'll just leave for the day, wear your jeans, we'll go out on a motorcycle ride and we'll have lunch and, and then you can, you know, I'll help you with your dissertation. I felt so um, disgusted by the obvious harassment and power plays that he was trying to use with me that I did not call him. Another year goes by and he saw me sitting out there and um, he stopped the entire court proceedings and he said, well, hello. <laughs> Well, hello, Miss Music. He goes, excuse me, everyone. We're going to take a quick recess. And he said, Miss Music, would you come with me? And called me to his chambers behind the bench. So he had me walking in front of an entire packed courtroom. And they all looked at me like, what on earth is going on? He sits back in his chair and he puts his feet up on the um, on the desk and his hands behind his desk. He's like, Miss Music, you never called me. I know, I'm so sorry. I've just been really busy with grad school. And I said, but I am here today to let you know the last year and a half that my client, my former client's been incarcerated, trying to like get all this information out. And he just interrupted me. He's like, he leaned forward. He's like, stop, stop. Do you want me to let him go? Yeah. And he's like, all right, I got, I got you. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna let him go. And he leaned forward. He gave me his card. He goes, but don't forget, you still owe me that lunch. So we come out from behind his chambers and the entire court was looking at me like, what just happened back there? Daddy goes, now I know what everybody's going to say, but Ms. Music has convinced me you, Mr. So-and-so, have been doing so well. I'm just going to let everything go. Um, a quid pro quo type of thing where he was going to let my client go with the understanding that I was going to have lunch with him and ride his motorcycle and God only knows what that would have entailed, if not maybe an all out assault. It just really feels gross. I saw this, this five rape prevention tips, right? But it's geared towards men. Um, it's kind of like a play because women normally carry rape whistles and women normally have to, you know, use the body system and stuff. So this is directed to, to, towards men. If someone is drunk, don't rape them. When you see someone walking by themselves, leave them alone. 
Use the body system. It is difficult for you to stop yourself from raping someone. Ask a trusted friend to accompany you at all times. Carry a rape whistle. If you find that you are about to rape someone, blow the whistle until someone comes to stop you. Don't forget, honesty is the best policy. When asking someone out, don't pretend that you're interested in them as a person. Tell them straight up that you expect to be raping them later. If you don't communicate your intentions, they may take it as a sign that you do not plan to rape them. Rape culture directs women to police their clothing, beverages, behavior, and sexuality at all times to avoid men. It portrays men as powerless against their violent sexual urges. Rape culture demeans everyone and everyone should speak out against rape culture. Usually in these conversations, we tend to talk about, okay, well, you know, here are things that we can do so we don't get raped. These are things we constantly have to think about as women. A lot of times we have to be policing our, ourselves just because we don't want to be assaulted. We don't want to, you know, end up on, on, on the wrong side of the stick. And so constantly we're, we're receiving the short end of the stick. I, I liked this post on Facebook just because I was like, okay, you know, it really does portray men as these helpless, you know, defenseless, powerless beings who have to hurt women. And that's how rape culture perceives males, you know? If you don't see yourself as someone who has to go out and hurt another person, you know, for power, for control, for whatever reason, you should be standing against this too. That way, we need to flip the script too. Um, you know, feminism and all of that is for men. And when you think of um, Audre Lorde and you start looking at, you know, um, hooks, and those books that talk about feminism is for everybody. <laughs> but yeah, when you start looking at um, feminism is for everybody, I mean, we really all should be engaged in this conversation because it makes us all look bad, really. Women are in a bad position because of what's happening to us, because of the patriarchy, because of the capitalism, but then men also look bad. And we should all be working together to, to change this narrative. I was 15, still in the valley Walking in a parking garage First time I met a wolf in person At first I thought it was a dog I tried to dodge him, he was faster Than I'd ever had to be He smiled and howled in the same moment it knocked the wind right out of me Though I got away I never walked the same mm -hmm. Now I bury my smile and show no interest
So my story happened my freshman year of college. Um, it was in like October, <clears throat> and um, was at a party, and I met this guy. He was in a frat, and he was super nice at first. Obviously, like he had one objective. <laughs> But, um, he invited me to one of his frat parties. So I was like, okay, sure. If that's what college is, go to frats. So I went and I, I drank and I wasn't really good drinking. So I got too drunk too fast. And then he brought me to his room and he was very high and very drunk. And he was sort of just like, kind of like, come on, like, just like, let's, you know, like, persuading me to have sex and um I was scared to say no because no one told me it was okay to say no and so like we got into it and I, I sex was still a big question mark so I only done it like once I don't know what's going on and um it became really painful it it, it wasn't right my body was physically rejecting the sex and I started bleeding and when it was done he was like oh yeah you're freaky I like that and I was in shock because when the pain started happening I couldn't even talk I had I had just had my head down and was like scared and then it was like 3 a.m and I like put my clothes back on and just walked back to my dorm alone and I cried the whole walk and I didn't tell anybody because I thought I would look bad and then I had to see this guy all the time and he had no idea what he did to me it was I was it was pressure I was pressured into it and my body physically rejected it and I couldn't say anything because I was so scared because he was so much older than me but it, it took me months to realize that was sexual assault. It took it took months to realize that's considered assault, and I like can confidently say that now. Then my boyfriend at the time used it against me. Like he, I remember specifically being told, "What's the point of the Me Too movement if you won't report this guy?" And I felt so much guilt when I was just trying to move on because of him. Like I felt forced to tell my peers when I wasn't ready to. And I ended up having to confront the guy about it because it became so prominent. And um, he apologized. I told him I couldn't forgive him. You can't forget that. Like, <laughs> but I mean, he was respectful about it, but I never wanted that conversation. I didn't want that apology, but I felt forced to do it. And I was just a freshman. Can you speak on the importance of women's reproductive rights to those women who have been raped or sexually assaulted? Well, the primary thing that also does a system, Lex, yeah, I think you're, is, is pregnancy as, as, the, as the at stake. Then that's tied to finances. That's tied to educational opportunity. That's tied to um, ability to get an abortion if you wanted or needed it at that time. And then you have to negotiate that out as well. And those stakes are really, really high for women, no matter what. Um, of course, you know, there's um, sexually transmitted disease, which is always for any gender an issue, but that can also lead to infertility. It can lead to long-term issues. Um, and it could make it so that you can't have pregnancy when you want it. So, I mean, there's stakes there for females that are pretty profound. And those stakes are being discussed, as I think you pointed out, Lex, by by people that are not that don't have those stakes and never have to really deal with that. The reality of that the reality of the economics of pregnancy, of, of how that pulls you out of the job market in a regard, or how it can make you, make you, even as a pregnant woman walking around, how people then start to own your body and make judgments about you depending on your age or, um, you know, and then telling you when and where you have to have this, you know, have or not have a child 
it, it's very odd when your body then becomes negotiated as a marketplace. That's what makes it different for women. I think the pregnancy issue to some extent. Parenthood, but 
There's a group of crunchy granola Christians outside with signs and hate in their eyes, and you've never felt so alone in the world. Of course you don't tell your friends that you're pregnant from a night you don't even remember. How do you tell someone that? Even if you know they fuck you, how do you... How do you look someone in their eyes and watch them lose all respect for you? How do you watch love get completely subsumed by pain? You think about ending your life, your lives. You're so scared. You don't. You gather the courage to tell someone. You cry into their arms for hours and they take you back to that little brick building and they hold your hand while you go through that little procedure that makes you think you can forget you never will but at least it's not a baby i was lucky i was lucky to have someone who loved me enough to go with me i was lucky to have a place to go to in my state so many women don't. So many women know their abusers. They suffer in silence. They bear the children and the cross. Imagine what it would be like if women had these resources available. If they knew it wasn't supposed to hurt. If they knew it wasn't all supposed to hurt. I don't know who decided being a woman was supposed to be painful. A man, <laughs> probably. So, when I say I like pain, it's the pain that I choose. What makes me feel good. Not the pain that cuts deep into your heart in a waiting room with a little thing you've only known for a month and will never know again. Contrary to what people might believe, women who get abortions aren't heartless. We feel the thing. Some of us even start to like the thing. But we like ourselves more. And no one is going to look out for us except for us. healing isn't linear. I want to say that even if you don't tell your story out loud, healing isn't linear. It might be a fight one day and it might be easy the next. You might sit in there in the gulag for three months and then next thing you know, you might break free. You never know. But healing isn't linear and it doesn't look the same for everybody. And a lot of times when we are healing and talking about these conversations, I don't like to say it's a safe space because there is a, a, a chance that you might be triggered. You, you might be activated. But it is a brave space so that you are not being judged. You are being loved on and comforted, uh, being able to stand on your own two feet and stand in your truth because it is your story. And that's also a way of taking your power back, taking your voice back, taking your body back, like your body is your own. That's one of my uh, phrases now for even myself as somebody that has been traumatized uh, sexually throughout most of my life my body is my own and I take back my autonomy. This is me and this is who I am. This is a part of my story, not who I am. You know, this was a part of my journey. It's not who I am. That's how I like to frame it. And I also, for people that have been traumatized, I like to celebrate them. Thank you for being here. And I congratulate you and celebrate you for getting out of that situation whether it was you started healing maybe next week or years from now it may have happened when you were a child but you're healing now and that's something to be celebrated because you're doing the work for yourself and not for anybody else it, it, it's not okay what happened but it's definitely okay for you to have that a part of your narrative but not internalize it and make it your own because you are your own person and you are beautiful and you deserve to be celebrated each and every step of your journey Two weeks in 
Feeling. I want to start healing 